Hi there and welcome to PhD at Living. Today is a bad chemistry rant where I yell about a non-chemist ignoring the chemistry and butchering it. Today's topic, azodicarbonamide. Come on in. Circa 2014, an internet chemist caused a ruckus about this chemical here, azodicarbonamide, IUPAC named carbamoyl aminourea. The crux of the argument was that azodicarbonamide is used as a foaming agent in things like yoga mats and shoes. However, azodicarbonamide was also used as a bleaching agent in flour for the breads at Subway. Therefore, when Subway was making your meatball sandwich, they were putting yoga mats in your food. Let's look at each one of those arguments uh, one by one. Number one. Chemicals that are hard to pronounce are inherently bad for you. You ever heard someone read the back of a food label and they're like, it's got chemicals on it that I don't even know how to say. That can't be good. I know, right? I mean, how does anyone pronounce chemical names? They're like a string of syllables that one puts together to make a coherent idea. If only regular words worked like that instead of having nothing to do with putting a string of syllables together to make a coherent idea. And it isn't just that the chemicals are hard to pronounce, it's because they're hard to pronounce that automatically means they're bad for you. Easy things to pronounce have nothing to hide. Hard things to pronounce are so obviously nefarious, I don't even need to tell you about it. Let me give you an example. Dihydrogen monoxide. Sounds scary, right? Dihydrogen monoxide. Wait a minute. That's, that's just water. Here's another good one. Acetyl salicylic acid. God, look at that! It's so beefy, it's obviously gotta be bad. Huh? What? It's... Aspirin? Damn it! you didn't tell me these things were good for you! I got you now. Look at this mother effer. 2S5R6R33-dimethyl7-oxo62-phenylacetamido-4-thio-1-azobicyclo-320-heptane-2-carboxylic acid. This thing is so big and so complex and has such a long name that I will not be told that it is not bad for you. What? F***ing penicillin? I'm done. Which brings us to the actual point here. Just because a chemical's name is long or hard to pronounce or you don't immediately recognize it does not mean it's automatically bad for you. Man, I hate that argument. Number two. Chemicals only have one single purpose. All right, Mr. Smarty Pants Chemist, let's see if you can follow this one. Azodicarbonamide is used in yoga mats. Therefore, anything that has azodicarbonamide in it equals yoga mats. What? This isn't that hard. It's used in yoga mats. Uh-huh. Therefore, anything with azodicarbonamide in it is a yoga mat. No, I, I definitely didn't follow that one. Yoga mats. Yeah, I, I heard that, but I still don't think- Yoga mats! But what about- Yoga mats. Yoga mats. Yoga, yoga mats. Shut up! You are not allowed to talk anymore. Just because one application of a chemical is bad doesn't mean all applications are therefore bad. Let's go back to water. Do you know humans torture each other with water? They pour it over a rag on somebody's face and waterboard them. Well, because water is used in one horrible application, we should just take it out of everything. In fact, I'm never going to drink water again. That makes sense, doesn't it? No, that's idiotic. You obviously have to look at the application of the material instead of just writing it off as a whole as being dangerous. That is related to our third fallacy. Number three, chemicals can only react in one way. Has anyone ever told you what azodicarbonamide actually does in yoga mats? Well, no, but that obviously doesn't matter. The final configuration is the only thing of concern here, right? I thought I told you to be quiet. As it turns out, thermal decomposition of azodicarbonamide releases nitrogen, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and ammonia. And that's about it. The azodicarbonamide in yoga mats is used to create gases which foam and create the light density yoga mat rubber. How about that? Three of these chemicals exist in air which, spoiler alert, you've been breathing your entire life since the doctor smacked you when he pulled you out of your mama. So wait, this stuff just makes relatively non-harmful gases when it's heated? Yes. Now you're thinking with portals. Those internet chemists told you that as soon as azodicarbonamide went into your subway bread, it would make yoga mats everywhere. Not so much. So close, internet chemists. In fact, azodicarbonamide doesn't even turn into those gases when it's put in the oven at subway. When used as a flour bleaching agent, azodicarbonamide turns into almost quantitatively this chemical, biurea. Aha, and that's dangerous. No, lie down before you hurt yourself. 
by urea is basically the same as azo dicarbonamide, except you hydrogenate the azo double bond and put the hydrogens on there. I know this is going to blow your mind, and it's against all odds, but when by urea goes into the body, it's unmetabolized and passes straight through, completely intact. Which basically means not harmful. A potential secondary reaction has azo dicarbonamide decomposing into semi-carbazide. We'll talk about that in a hot minute. And finally, number four, dosage isn't important. This one really bugs me and is dangerous. People just go on PubMed or NIH or something and just fire off an article. Well, you know what? I read those articles that the internet chemist referenced, and you know what they said? Azodicarbonamide has very low acute toxicity and took prolonged, repeated exposure, like 200 milligrams per kilogram per day for an entire year before any adverse symptoms could be detected. Key point here, this is of the pure, raw azodicarbonamide compound. Your bread at Subway is not 100% azodicarbonamide. The FDA has listed a limit of how much azodicarbonamide can be in your bread flour, and you know what that limit is? 0.0045%, okay? Math time! Per their website, a serving size of bread at Subway is 80 grams. I'm going to assume there are two servings per 6-inch sub because serving sizes are comically small and who wouldn't want to just take their 6-inch sub and cut it in half? Anyway, four servings at 80 grams a pop is 320 grams of bread per Subway footlong sub. If 100% of that bread is flour, which of course we know it isn't, the 0.0045% of azodicarbonamide in that bread is 14.4 milligrams. I'm going to abbreviate the azodicarbonamide, AZA, for the rest of the way. We know from the rat studies that 200 milligrams of AZA per kilogram body weight per day is the daily recommended dose for about a year before bad stuff starts to happen. I weigh 75 kilograms, so 75 times 200 equals 15,000 milligrams of AZA per day for Devon. I'm going to round up the 14.4 milligrams to 15 to make the math easier, but if we take 15,000 divided by 15, you guessed it, I need to eat approximately 1,000 foot-long subs per day for a year to get that 200 milligram per kilogram per day and for bad stuff to maybe happen from pure azodicarbonamide. Let's really hammer this one home. If 100% of the bread is flour, which we know it isn't, and the azodicarbonamide does not react into anything else, which we know it does, I have to eat a thousand foot long sandwiches per day for 365 days consecutively to maybe have some adverse effects from the azodicarbonamide. Yes, let's definitely get this harmful and toxic chemical out of our bread. What a bunch of jokes. I saw another argument that suggested azodicarbonamide decomposes into this material, semi-carbazide, and this one does have some known toxicity to it. I found a paper online that said 3.6 mg per kilogram per day was about the allowable limit in female rats. Male rats were unaffected for some reason, don't know why, but let's just assume for the purpose of argument that male rats are the same as female rats, and male humans are the same as male rats, and I identify as a male human. So we can take the numbers that we got from azodicarbonamide, 14.4 mg per kg per day, and compare that to 3.6 mg per kg per day the semi-carbazide and assume it's about a 1 to 5 ratio. So instead of a thousand foot long Subway subs I have to eat every day to get the allowable limit where bad stuff might happen, I instead with semi-carbazide have to eat 200 Subway subs per day. Again, so dangerous. Let's recap. 1. Chemicals with hard to pronounce names aren't automatically harmful. 2. Just because a chemical has one bad purpose doesn't make all of its purposes bad. 3. Chemicals can react in more than one way. And four, the exposure amount of a given chemical is extremely important. In deference to the other side of the argument here, I have a confession to make. I've been making a very large assumption, and that assumption is this. I believe peer-reviewed published medical literature has more veracity than the opinion of someone on the internet. That being said, could the numerous studies suggesting azodicarbonamide has low acute toxicity be wrong? Absolutely. Could you die from one serving of azodicarbonamide in one Subway sandwich on one day? Well, it's extremely unlikely, but probably. And that, my friends, is what a PhD at living is all about. I ask you to listen to my viewpoint and then make up your own mind. Take a peek at some of the various sources of info I put in this video's description. Read them and analyze them. Always question the ramblings of people on the internet, myself included. And with that, rant over. See you next time.
can we just sit here and enjoy the one thing that makes me a little bit happy? This fresh, delicious, tasty, meaty, turkey-filled cold-cut combo!